uh, to Romans chapter 7. If you don't, you can grab a Bible. There's Bibles in the back. You're welcome to get up. This is a really relaxing document, so feel free to do yourself. Grab a Bible if you need one. If you don't own a Bible, you can take one of these very Bibles home with you. It's, uh, it's our gift to you. There's some of them in the back. You can show them to you. Check out the station and or in some of the tables as well. But open up Romans 7 if you would. And I'm going to start by reading a passage. We'll get to Galatians. I know we're in Galatians here. We are in Galatians. We are now in Romans. The cool thing is we've been studying a book in the Bible called Galatians in the New Testament for several weeks. We've only got one more week left after this. And then we'll, and then we'll start a new series. I'm going to just keep into our series. We're going to do a series on the parables of Jesus, which I'm really excited about. So our next series will start um, on Jesus' parables. So, and we're going to call it Tell Me a Story. So we'll have several parables that we study. That's going to happen in two weeks from now. We'll kind of kick that series off. But it's not going to finish Galatians 3 this week and next week, which is really good. But to start off with today, I want to read you a passage in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 17. Let's read it together. We've got it on the screen behind me. Now I'll follow. It says this. Verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. The evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if you're being really honest, would you say amen? If you're being really honest with yourself, would you kind of say, yeah, maybe I get that? Here, the Apostle Paul, by the way, who wrote about two thirds of this book, says, I cannot do the right thing. I have this battle raging war within me, and I want to do the right thing. I want to fight the Lord. I want so badly to do. And I keep failing over and over. And so this becomes one of the great paradoxes of the Christian life that we read today. Because we have this intense struggle within ourselves. Because at one level, we say, but I want to do the right thing. Even if you're here today and you're not a Christian, maybe it's your new church, then God's great to have you. You're welcome back anytime. We don't expect you to believe everything we believe. We don't have any expectation on you except that you take the Bible a little bit seriously just for the day. And if you do, I mean, I think anyone can relate to that scripture. Any human being can relate to that and say, yeah, I get that. I get that. There's times in my life when I wish I could do the right thing, but the wrong thing looks so, so good right now, and I, and I find that I want to do it. The reality is the Bible calls that in here the sinful nature of our very flesh. But it's a good sense. And we have this war that wages within ourselves to want to do the right thing, and yet also we have this thing that says, no, I really want to do what's better for me. And that's the wrong thing. So we get this picture here. The Bible describes two ways of living. One way is according to the Spirit, and another is according to the flesh. And the Bible acknowledges that they struggle with this one. That's the way they live. I used to have a friend who used to describe that he had like two, you know, angels sitting on his shoulder. He like had the had the bad angel and then the good angel, right? And they would speak into his ear. And this is a friend who's telling me this, like not just the cartoons. He's probably seen the cartoons and it's so funny. But he was telling me about how one would whisper in his ear and the other would whisper in his ear. He goes, well, which one do you want to do? And I was like, oh, shut up. You don't want to do that. I'm like, oh, okay. And I was like, yeah, I get the idea. And the reality is I wish it were that easy. Because I wish it was something externally that was motivating us. But here Paul says it's actually internally motivating us. That's where it hurts. That's where things get tough. Because if it was something external that was fighting against us, we could just kind of punch it and say, I'm walking you part of that. We're going to do what they do. But here the Bible acknowledges that we have something within ourselves fights against wanting to do the right thing that we should be doing. So if we're being honest, we read the scripture in Romans 8, don't we just say that this sounds absolutely devastating? Don't we say that this just seems impossible? So how do we battle with that? How do we do the right thing? And we have this struggle living within us, and we have this, this desire to do the wrong thing. And how do we live the right thing? What does that look like? How is it possible to find some victory over doing the right thing. Maybe some of you in here are dealing with that whole idea of having the same thing that you've been fighting against. Maybe some of you are a Christian. 
look at it and say, well, that sounds really supernatural. But the reality is when I'm trying to fight sin, most of the time I go back to the things that come naturally to me. I say, like, oh, you know what, I'm going to fight sin in my prayer. I'm going to journal for it. I journal for the things that come to mind. I keep looking at sin and fighting it. Or, or I say, you know, if I just go to church more, if I worship more, if I you know, fill in the blank, I, I go back to all these kind of easy things, these, these best practices in the Christian life where I say, I'm going to fight that sin. And to be honest with you, some of them actually work. Sometimes they do work for me. But the reality is that I look at the scriptures and I say, well, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I say, that took nothing for me to walk by the Spirit if I woke up a little bit earlier on Monday morning than the Bible. I mean, there was nothing supernatural about that. I, I just woke up earlier. Now, maybe it is supernatural for some of you who are not morning people. Like, that is a miracle. Are you kidding me? I you received the wake up message. with this because I, I just say a lot of my fighting against my flesh happens to be natural. It happens to be something that I'm going to put hard at myself. And yet Paul here says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I read the Bible and I see the Holy Spirit working in the lives of people, in the lives of the early church in such a way that what, what happened in that would not have happened unless the Holy Spirit was at work. And I see amazing things that happen in the Bible when the Holy Spirit gets involved.
It's like chant around the fireplace. We hate you, winter. We hate you. It's really weird, I know, but we like it. And so we've done it for like five years now, so it's really fun to do. So I'm out there hacking the Christmas tree up. It's just my way of saying, yes, and when the brain eventually gets the subtracts of burning the Christmas tree, it just feels cathartic in some way. We sit around the Christmas tree. And so, so the funny thing is, we put it in a, in a, in a fire pit, right? It's wonderful. If you put it in a fire pit, you can't put too much in there because it keeps exploding. So we don't want to go that route. So, but the reality is, I think sex in some ways is kind of like a pit. Whereas in the fire pit, it's a great thing. It's beautiful. It's something we can dance around and have joy with, right? But when it comes outside the fire pit and starts to burn everything down, that's when things are bad. That's the sex thing. When it's within the confines of what it's supposed to be, it's beautiful. And when it's outside of that, it's just really it's reality. So to some listen here are saying, person who said, like, I've chosen to fight with someone the rest of my life, and it's going to be you, okay? That's who I've chosen. That's the person. And, and when that marriage relationship is there, it's beautiful. It's within the confines of that, that idea of the fire pit, and that's where sex is happening. And anything outside of it, anything, is flesh. And the reality is, we live in such a tempting way. It's, it's real. It's real. It's real. To walk in the Holy Spirit. If there's any place in our lives where we can say, walk in the Holy Spirit, it's when it's so real. It's this moment. I wonder if things are real. I don't know. But when our God says this, what's the most important thing about this for you? It's describing what it is. The second category is this it's, it's bad religion, not the man. If you're like me, the child of the angels, right? Some of you are like me, you know, you love the angels. Oh, I see someone. Thank you. You, love, you guys love me any, except for one person. Not the man. The second category is bad religion. And the idea behind this is idolatry and sorcery. Now, I'm guessing in here we don't have many witches in this place, right? I'm just kind of guessing. I don't really know, but I'm, I'm assuming that they actually do exist and they are incredibly in various places. And I think there are evil spirits and forces that we cannot see that may be very surprising to us if we could see in some way. And that would show that we just can't trust or create them for our kids. But I think the reality is this Talk about setting up something as God would set it up. This is the idea of idolatry. This is the idea. 
saying something to me is more important than God. Idolatry, I think, in some ways we deal with this every day. We put things in God's place, whether this is people, possessions, professional accomplishments, or idolatry in our lives. When we put those things, our happiness, based on those things above God and the happiness that He gives to us, we can consider ourselves people who destroy the Lord's idols. And that may sound weird, but it's really not hard to make a point out this morning. But we can. In some ways, you can. You can put these things above God. You can put those things above God. And the reality is, this is, a, this is a unique thing. Do you know that idols can even be good things? Idols can be good. Because any time you take a good thing and make it into a good thing, it's good becomes an idol. So if you take something for me, or for me, something I love, my family, and it's a whole new world, which is a pretty good gift. I can't imagine doing that with my own family now, but it's a good gift. I just think they're fantastic. And I've, I've learned in my life that I can put that above God in some ways. I can adjust my life and be so Excellent in my fear setting that I'm not focusing on the Lord and what He wants to do. Well, that's because we get so busy and we do sports and, and vacations and all of those things. I, sometimes I can put a good thing and make it into a good thing. I can put what I love about God in my in my calendar, in my mind, but I make it into an idol. And the reality is that even puts it above idol. Because we can take a good thing and make it into a good thing instead. Or the source of the piece of this thing is that is are you trying in some means the Trying in some way that the Holy Spirit to reach out to God and have Him answer you. Are there places where you're trying to get to God that are not through His Word, through His communion with you, or through the Holy Spirit working in your life? Are there places that are kind of that distortion? Third category is attitude. Third category is attitude. Things are bad. I'm not saying that intrinsically it's bad to have a drink or something like that. 
someone like you sounded like my GPS. That was so good. Recalculate, yeah, recalculate, you know. So you can ignore it sometimes, too, because you don't have to it. And like, there's a stupid thing that's taking over my brain, you know, like, I'm going to drive and drive. And then you'll eventually wake up and view that reality is a recalculation of my brain or focus on my brain, which is a recalculation. And the reality is that that's what we're saying, right? And I think we see things like the fruit of the Spirit as, like, the direction and direction to all these things, like, doing these nine things, you know. But the reality is, I think it's more of a guidepost in life than it really is. So when we take the road that the GPS is not taking, or when we go to those things that we know don't matter, we'll say it's a distraction to see that. And the beauty is, it all leads to one thing. It's still what we can do with our lives. And, and the reality is, these things, these fruits of spirit, if you look at them and you can find them in the Bible, you know, say, wish I could see that better. That's the key. That's the point. That's what Jesus wants. That's what sanctification all is all about. That's walking in the spirit of God. And when we see ourselves going off the deep end, one of the things we're dealing with when we see ourselves in the thick of the fight with the flesh and the mind is that I'm not going to win. And so we want to say, you know, recalculate. Go to the coach. This isn't the coach. Go to the gym. This isn't the gym. This isn't the Sunday morning classes for me. This is not Sunday night. This is not Sunday night. This is super. Spirit in this to help me in this thing as well. As he did this, I think there are several ways. Um, and I try to talk to you all this in you know, really three main ways. I see it how God has helped us see it as well as help us. And I see big things in our life that are getting big side effects. So if you become a person who is wandering from the way, if you become a person who's living according to the flesh, that, that check in your heart where it says you're not doing the right thing, that's the Holy Spirit being. Christian life is unique. It's the only religion in the world that I can think of that really requires something of us and supplies the appeal of human fulfillment and requirements. And that's the cool thing about Christianity. That's the cool thing about you giving your thing to this church thing. And you're sitting here today and you say, look, I, I, I relate to some of those. I get kind of what you're saying. But I don't know how to live according to this. Here's the cool thing. 